Hi, I'm Sarah. I thank you all so much for being here today. I wish that I could be there with you um, at the One Mind Music Festival and Scientific Symposium. Um, but I want to thank the One Mind Foundation so much for giving me this opportunity and for funding our research. I'm really excited to tell you about the work that we're going to be doing, um, specifically on insular cortex circuits underlying maladaptive feeding behaviors. So I wanted to start by talking about why our lab has decided to study eating disorders. And the reason is that there's really truly an urgent need. So I think that not many people realize that the mortality rate of anorexia nervosa is up to 50%, which is actually the highest of any psychiatric disorder. And at the same time, despite the fact that this is so devastating to patients, there are no FDA approved drugs for treatment. And so anorexia patients really have very little recourse um, to treat their symptoms other than inpatient or outpatient therapy. And even worse, compared to other mental illnesses, anorexia receives very little federal funding for research. So again, I'm like particularly grateful to the One Mind Foundation for recognizing the importance of conducting research into the basic biological mechanisms of anorexia, because there's very little opportunity to do so otherwise. And so why is this? Why are there no FDA approved treatments? Why is there so little federal funding? Why is there so little research being done into the neurobiological mechanisms underlying anorexia. And I would argue that there's a lot of stigma surrounding anorexia. And so on the right, I'm just showing some of the things that patients hear from people, like this is just a girl thing and you just want attention. And I think in particular, there is this idea that anorexia is a new disease and that if we just got rid of fashion magazines and fashion models, um, this problem would go away. But in fact, if you look at the history of anorexia, it is a very, very old disease. It's been present for a long time. So as early as the 1300s, St. Catherine of Siena is documented to have had anorexia nervosa, and she actually um, eventually died from her symptoms. Mary, Queen of Scots in the 1500s, is also widely believed to have suffered from anorexia nervosa. And the real first documented cases of anorexia um, were documented by William Gull as early as the 1800s. So this is not a new disorder. And another element of the stigma in this regard is that anorexia is a disease that only affects women, and that is also not true. So in men, um, anorexia is also documented as early as the 1300s um, in a religious context, but it was called asceticism. And the first documented case of anorexia in a young man, a young man was as early as 1790. So again, um, it is not restricted to women. It is not a new disorder. The second element of stigma that I think really affects research into the biological mechanisms underlying anorexia um, has to do with animal models. So there's this idea that anorexia is a uniquely human phenomenon that can't be modeled in animals. But if you look at the genes that underlie anorexia, which I'm showing here on the left, and you correlate them with the genes underlying other mental health disorders, you can see that there's really a strikingly high correlation in particular with obsessive compulsive disorder compared to the correlation with genes that are underlying other metabolic um, factors. And if you look at the cycle of obsessive compulsive disorder, where compulsions provide temporary relief um, for the obsessions and anxiety distress, you can see a very similar cycle for restrictive eating, where restrictive eating or avoidance of food provides temporary relief um, for anxiety and distress. And so it, it's my firm belief that if we can model depression and anxiety and obsessive compulsive disorder in animal models, which of course we do, we can also model restrictive eating and anorexia-like behavior um, in mice. And so in our lab, we are focusing um, looking in mice and in particular looking at the insular cortex. And the reason that we've decided to focus on the insular cortex first is because in human imaging studies, um, it's been shown that the insular cortex is very involved in food-related processes. And in particular, if you look here at E, you can see that in eating disorder patients, um, the patients with eating disorders show higher activation of the insular cortex when viewing high calorie foods compared to low calorie foods. 
And at the same time, in our lab, we have been studying the insular cortex neurons and how they respond during an overconsumption paradigm. So we're using here a technique called fiber photometry, where we can track calcium activity in mice um, while they are freely moving. And what you are looking at um, in blue, anytime you see these blue lines or these blue squares, you're looking at a feeding bout. So when the mouse is actively eating, and you can see that these insular cortex neurons, their activity is very highly correlated to when the mouse is eating. So we know from both human imaging studies and from these mouse studies that the insular cortex is very involved in feeding related processes and is likely involved in eating disordered behavior. But we have no idea how the insular cortex is actually involved um, you know, from the biological mechanisms in anorexia-like behavior. And so our goal is to use an animal model of anorexia to try to understand what these basic mechanisms in the insular cortex might be. And so right now, the gold standard for um, studying anorexia in a mouse is this one task called activity-based anorexia, where these mice are put on sort of a fasting regimen where they only get access to food for one to two hours a day. And at the same time, they get access to this wheel where they can engage in wheel running whenever they want. And so this is just a graph showing how um, these rodents will engage in wheel running when given the opportunity. And what you can see is that when we look at the body weight of these mice, you have control weight who continue, control mice who continue to gain weight as normal. You also have mice that um, are given access to this running wheel, but have free access to food and they also gain weight as normal. You have mice where you expose them to this food restriction model. And obviously those mice are gonna lose weight because they, um, they don't have as much access to food as these mice who have free access to food. But what's really striking about this model is that when you pair access to the wheel and restricted access to food, then these mice will actually prefer to run on the wheel rather than eat the food that's given to them. And so you can see that their weight decreases even lower than the ones that are just food restricted. The problem with this model is that it requires that the experimenter actually restrict the mouse's food intake um, throughout the entire experiment, which really is very different from anorexia nervosa, where patients are voluntarily engaging in food restrictive behavior. So our goal is to try to develop a better model, um, or at least a model in which um, these mice will voluntarily restrict their food intake. And so to do this, we are trying to take advantage of two elements that have not previously been modeled um, in anorexia models in mice. One is the element of food cues. So we know that food cues can be very triggering um, to eating disorder patients. And the other is the element of stress, because we know that in anorexia, like in most mental health disorders, there's an element of stress or trauma that often precedes um, the development of symptoms. And so what we do is we pair these stress sessions in mice with food cues that predict um, food delivery. And we do those for a number of sessions and then we stop. And then we ask how much the animals are gonna eat later on when they're exposed to these food cues or in their home cage. But what's important to note is that there is no more stress being applied um, and they have free access to food during this entire um, testing sessions. And so when we expose these mice to these food cues, they will actually engage in binge-like behavior. So you can see in red, these are the mice that were stressed. Um, and we use two forms of stress, restraint stress and stress plus isolation stress. Um, and but even though they binge in response to these food cues, if we monitor their weight in their home cage throughout this you know, entire two week period following these stress sessions, um, these mice will voluntarily um, restrict their body weight um, for the entire duration compared to these control mice. So they engage in what we call um, binge purge or binge restrict behavior where the cue promotes the binge, but then um, they will subsequently restrict their body weight in their home cage. And so our goal is to use this model to um, ensure that 
it you know, is a valid model. And then to try to identify a neural ensemble for anorexia um, using this model. And so we're using a technique um, called FOSTRAP where we can actually permanently tag neurons in the insular cortex that are involved in this behavior. And we can actually label them with a label that enables us to actually physically pull out ribosomes from those neurons so that we can send their mRNAs for sequencing um, and determine what are the actual genes. So this is just an example plot, but we wanna know what are the actual genes that are expressed by these neurons that we find are involved in anorexia. And I think this is particularly important for the aspect of treatment, because as I said, there are no FDA approved drugs. And so if we can find genes that are specific to populations of neurons that are involved in anorexia, those might be potential therapeutic targets for um, medications. Our second aim is to use this information to try to understand how the insular cortex actually mediates um, anorexia-like behavior. And so we're going to take advantage of new technology from the company Inscopix, which I think many of you are probably familiar with, where we can actually label um, these anorexia neurons um, with um, with a red label using the same FOSTRAP method. And then we can label all the insular cortex neurons with GCAMP so that we can monitor their calcium activity. And so we'll have neurons that are um, labeled with both in yellow. And then we can use these miniature microscopes in order to track the animal's behavior during the entire um, binge restrict anorexia model so that we can understand how these neurons actually behave and which ones are involved in anorexia and which ones might be involved in other behaviors. And so we hope through these studies that we can start at least to identify some of the basic neurobiological mechanisms that are underlying this type of restrictive eating that underlies anorexia. And so just to end, I want to thank everyone in my lab. These are the um, current members of my lab at the Max Planck Florida. I want to thank my um, former lab mates and collaborators at the Rockefeller University, in particular, Estefania Azevedo, um, and of course, my um, previous mentor, Jeffrey Friedman, um, who really helped lay the groundwork for these studies. Um, you can always find me um, on Twitter at Sarah underscore Stern, and I look forward to hopefully getting to know you all um, in the future. Thank you so much for, again, for this opportunity and enjoy the rest of the festival.